Welcome to Amp Books 11, everyone. Today I'm going to be reading an excerpt from The Five Levels of Attachment, Toltec Wisdom for the Modern World by Don Miguel Ruiz, Jr. And this is a really interesting book, one that I haven't gone back to for quite some time, but I saw it on my shelf and I just opened it up and I had a page that was dog-eared from some time ago where I read it. And when I reread it, it was really impactful. And I'm going to jump right in. There's not a lot of backstory that's needed other than perhaps a basic cursory knowledge of the story of Don Quixote. And the classic story of Don Quixote was an individual who was inspired by the romanticism of knights errant in a time far beyond that time where knights were picking up lances and swords and saving damsels. And he actually believed that he was a knight in a much more modern world. And he convinced his servant friend, Sancho Panza, to go along with him on this journey. And Sancho Panza was constantly questioning what he was doing, but still allowing Don Quixote to continue along his path and assisting him on that journey. So with that backstory, I think you'll be able to understand the passage that I'm about to read, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Like Don Quixote... We are constantly investing ourselves into the stories we want to believe. We create our own personas so that we are somebody. When I was young, I took on various identities. I was Miguel Ruiz Jr., the goth. Then I became Miguel the intellectual. Then Miguel the bohemian. Then Miguel the artist. And so on. I gave myself rules the same way Don Quixote created his rules through a distorted perception of who I was. Other people would see their own truth and wonder what I was doing, but all I saw was what I wanted to see. And like Don Quixote's faithful servant, Sancho Panza, I heard my stories and knew I was being a little crazy, but I believed them just in case I was right. I spent many years trying to live up to those images I created of myself before discovering that this is who I am. No story needed. It's really me. I am perfect at this very moment, and that is all I need to enjoy my life. Once I learned this, I could change my life in any direction I saw fit at any given moment. I now had the freedom to choose. The possibilities became endless, just as they had always been. I do not make changes in my life today because I feel I must change in order to accept and love myself. I make changes to express myself and experience more of life because I already accept and love myself for who I am. Flaws and defects originate from our own ideas and beliefs. In order to recognize perfection or to see the world and ourselves as is, we must become aware of our attachments to our ideas and beliefs and let go of them, even if only briefly, to see beyond them. I have always been perfect, and so have you. When we can't perceive this, it's because we are too busy judging everything for not being something other than what it is. The world and everything in it is perfect simply because it exists at this very moment, in the only manner it can possibly exist. The same is true for me and for you, and that is perfection. I am because I am at this moment. This is what freedom is, the ability to enjoy and be exactly who you are without suppressing yourself in the form of judgment. A bird is a bird, a saguaro is a saguaro, a human is a human, Miguel is Miguel, you are you. Perfect. This passage cuts to deep, 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 deep truth, and it's something that we can all resonate with because we've all gone through these various forms of our identities, and these identities were predicated on what we believed we should be and what we believed made us worthy of love. You know, I was Aubrey the basketball player. Like that was one of my 
early identities that I deeply attached myself to. And I loved myself based upon my performance on the court. I played well, I love myself more. And I perceived the love from my school, from my coaches, from my dad, from everybody around me based on the somebody that was a basketball player. So in that construct, I wasn't really free. I was bound by my performance. And although I always did my best, it, that didn't really matter. I didn't finish a game and go, oh, I did my best. I love myself. No, if I shot a bunch of three pointers and missed them all, I'd be like, fucking stupid idiot. Like you suck. Like that was terrible. That was a terrible game. It would haunt me for days or weeks until the next game. And hopefully I played better that next game. And if I played better that next game, well, then maybe I might actually love myself because all of the criteria for my own love and my own worth was based on the fact that I was a basketball player and I was good at playing basketball. So everything was predicated on that identity. Well, after high school, that largely shifted. Now I flirted around and played some basketball in college, but not the same level to which I was playing it in high school. I was mostly just playing intramural and playing around and practicing with the team sometimes and doing different things. And I still had some form of identity of that, but I started to branch out. So then I went into fitness, then I went into my fraternity, then I went into academics, and I went into even theater and different other ways where I became Aubrey the thespian or Aubrey the weightlifter, or Aubrey the this thing or that thing or this thing, and still loving myself based upon that identity. And then continuing on, your identity becomes Aubrey in whatever career that I was choosing. Aubrey running the marketing company. Aubrey running this thing. Aubrey as, as a success in life. Aubrey as a success as a podcaster. Aubrey, there's so many different forms of identification and attachment to our somebodyness that we really meter out our own love for ourself based upon how good we think we're doing at this identity that we've formed. But that's not really us. That's just what we're doing. It's not who we're being. It's not who we are. It's not me being me because I am. It's me doing something. And another one of those traps is Aubrey the lover. Aubrey the guy who has this girl or the guy who is loved by this person. Right? That is just part of your somebodyness. But again, anytime you attach yourself to these external points of validation, you're not free. Because so many of those things are out of your control. Yeah, you can practice harder. You can work harder on that thing. And that's great. And do it. And please do it. You know, and that's also part of the Toltec wisdom is to, yeah, do all the things. Play basketball. Be all the things. Just don't get attached to it. You know, it's that idea of controlled folly, which comes from a different Toltec school, Castaneda's Toltec school, where he's like, yeah, do everything, but just do it knowing that it's a game. And play the game, but know that you're worthy of love for just being you. And you can choose to be any version of you that you want. But really, the essence, not the function, but the essence of who you are is what counts. And then you're free. Because our essence, our true essence, is perfect. What we do, inherently, always flawed. So if we're judging ourselves by what we do... Well, we're always going to have an imperfect, very conditional form of love for ourselves, which is going to be very constrictive and very forced into certain patterns of action. Whereas if we recognize that our essence is what is important in relationship, in career, in life, then we will have the equanimity to understand that, ah, everything's okay. It's okay because it's okay. I am because I am, and it's all perfect, because it just is. It's accepting the isness of what actually is, rather than the projection of what we need to do to make things right. Because things are already right in the essence of who we are, in our consciousness, as the witness, as the awareness, as the soul, if your vocabulary permits the use of that. And so that's why I think Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., was talking about this in the five levels of attachment because he's talking about how attachment to our identity becomes a trap. And sure, like, I think we make excuses for attachment because 
It can make things more exciting. But every time we chase one of those highs of attachment, like every time I chased the high of feeling good about myself when I scored a bunch of points, then I would also have to suffer the low when I didn't score a bunch of those points. He even talks about in this book, he talks about attachment to a sports team, right? Like that can actually enhance, in some cases, the enjoyment of watching a sports game. I always find it kind of interesting when people use the word we to describe their favorite team, like if their team's the Chicago Bears or something, or like, oh man, we went out there, we killed it, or we sucked today. Like, we? What do you mean? Like, that's a team, you know? And you see this in all sports across the board. And yes, it will make you more involved and engaged in a certain way with that, and that might carry some pleasure, but it's also going to carry the suffering on the downside. So the invitation then is to enjoy it, play it full out, enjoy the game, get invested. But when it's over, it's smiles, it's laughs, it's the clink of a beer, it's the recognition that it's still a game and that the essence is still unchanged and still remains. And that's what we're trying to do is we clean these attachments off of ourselves, is know that we can engage in anything we want, but we're not attached to it. We're not attaching our love, our worth, our value to something that's outside of our control. We're attaching it to something that's unborn and undying, the truth of who we are. And when you do that, you can really enjoy everything, but without the downside of getting crushed when these things don't go well. And I think that's a big part of the art of life, the art of living well, is engage, enjoy, harness the ego, harness the attachments, but have that awareness always, the watcher, the one that's aware, that knows and laughs the whole time and is willing to just like a game that you're playing with your friends that you're not taking too seriously. You can sweep all the pieces off the game board, shuffle back all the money from the Monopoly game and just know that you had fun playing it because you're all right no matter what. That's the lessons from the five levels of attachment. Hope you enjoyed this reading from Ant Books 11, and I'll see you guys next week.